everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this incredibly important convening. I am so grateful to see so many of our local leaders who are moving and shaking things here in Boston alongside visitors from around the country uh, and, and even the world who are here to make a big difference. And um, we are so thankful for what's going to come out of this convening and, and that we will be able to carry forward here in Boston. Uh, I am delighted to be here with members of my senior leadership team. We have our Chief of Staff, Tiffany Chu, who's in the house, our Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, Shigun Iderwu, Senior Policy Advisor, Daniel Lander, and Stephen Lee, who's been all things uh, finance, tech, uh, tech financing and, and climate tech financing in particular. I had the privilege of meeting some of you a couple, a, a little bit ago when we had the kickoff event. And I shared then that there really is no better time or place to be to get down in the, in the maybe I should say, down in the seaweed of uh, what we're, we're talking about here for the future of our planet. Boston is the hub of the universe, and we are working every day to become the hub of climate tech as well. This is the city where people for centuries have come to make a difference, to do good, to invest, in our shared humanity and the innovations that will keep generation after generation thriving. It's a direct result of the fact that Boston has always chased after innovation, and we are working every day to make sure that the work, that the leadership that we have here will keep our planet livable. That means both creating the conditions for entrepreneurship and innovation to flourish here, and leveraging the power and resources of local government to lead, experiment and innovate even within the public sector. I'll start a little bit with the environment that we've created. Boston's business community is unique in that we benefit from being home to the best colleges and universities in the world. These institutions offer not only the best and brightest talent, but also highly developed technical infrastructure that lends itself to creating groundbreaking climate technology. Most important of all, our nation-leading biotech industry has established and nurtured a thriving culture of innovation embedded here in our city. From the isolation of the first hereditary human cancer gene and the invention of baby formula to the first successful use of anesthesia during surgery and the creation of the COVID-19 vaccine, Boston has always been a city that bets big on the future of humanity. Today, that's translating into growth we've seen in the Seaport Innovation District and the thriving climate tech community taking root in the Hood Park redevelopment in Charlestown, home or soon to be home to firms like Archaea Bio, Lydian, Indigo Technologies, Mori, and more. And as for what we're doing at the city, uh, there's a long, long list that I, I won't get into all the pieces of it, but I do want to share a little about our most recent investment in climate technology. Uh, we are working every day to make sure that from coastal resilience, heat preparedness, sustainable transportation, innovations in building decarbonization, everywhere possible, the city is rolling up our sleeves and making a difference. Uh, here, we're adding one more list to that with an announcement today. Uh, later this afternoon, we'll be announcing our new head of the Office of, Urgen Office of Emergency Management, who will hold the title of Chief of Emergency Preparedness. His hiring is an important step towards reorienting our office around preparing for the worst that climate change will bring and being ready for everything from extreme heat to coastal flooding. So I'm so excited for the leadership that Adrian Jordan will bring to this role and that we will be ensuring that we're taking on more than just responding to fires and, and uh, utility breaks, but really orienting ourselves to be ready for that next big storm and whatever may come our way. Two months ago, we began using climate tech startup FloodMap to provide real-time flood monitoring services to enhance our emergency preparation, response, and recovery. Because we know that as sea levels continue to rise, we'll need to build out Boston's flood event protocol to be as robust and automatic as we know how to deal with snowstorms here in New England. Now, as you head into this final day of the inaugural climate tech conference, Please know that you're doing so in a place where, and at a moment when, you have the energy of the entire city behind you. You are here in the birthplace of democracy, at the beginning of a different kind of revolution, 
one that will chart the course of not just one nation, but the entire planet. So please carry with you the momentum that I've had the chance to feel and experience all across our city into the rest of today's events. And please come back soon. The House of Blues is an incredible venue, but it feels a little bit different right now than it, than it will uh, in a couple hours. And we always uh, want to be a home to those willing to bet big on humanity's future to ensure that we are working together to shape that next uh, round of innovation. Thank you all so much for being here. Welcome to Climate Tech 2024, live from Citizens House of Blues, Boston. Thank you for joining us. Please give your attention to the stage as we begin our next session. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce this session. Uh, we wanted to talk about what's happening in the polar regions, in the cryosphere, and how it really affects us right here in our hometowns, on our streets, actually at our own houses. And so, you know, to put this panel together, um, I'm going to start with some introductions. We have some slides, and then we can open it up for Q&A, or we can have some discussions uh, amongst ourselves as well. Okay, I'll start first. I'm Anu Singh. I'm a professor at Northeastern University. Uh, I like to say I'm bipolar. I've spent the last 20 years of my life um, using robots in Antarctica, Greenland, and the Arctic. Sarah? Thanks, Anu. And thanks, all of you, for attending this session with us. I'm Sarah Das. I'm a scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I suppose I'm also bipolar, like Hanu. I've spent um, close to 30 years working in the Arctic and the Antarctic, leading expeditions to the top of Greenland, the interior of Antarctica, trying to understand how these sensitive and fragile ice sheets are responding to climate change and why that matters for the rest of our planet. Increasingly concerned with what's been happening, I've also now turned a lot of my attention to trying to figure out how we can best understand sea level rise and flooding in our own backyards. Jennifer? Hi, I'm Jennifer Lee. I'm a professor of the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department and also Computer Science at Northeastern University. My area of research is machine learning and artificial intelligence, so I work on foundations on machine learning. But also, um, you know, machine learning can be applied to to, to any applications. I have a passion for applications of machine learning that can help society. In my way, I have worked on AI in, in climate and also in health um, for, for several years. OK. So I'm going to start by just giving you an overview of what we've been doing. Uh, you know, We wanted to think about what's happening at the poles. We all know things are melting, and they're melting and, and doing so at, um, at a increasingly fast rate. Now, one thing that I've been very interested in is, and of course, a lot of these measurements we can make with satellites, but we're also still very interested in making measurements locally. We know the local communities there are really affected, and um, unfortunately, our models that we have from satellites aren't as accurate as they could be. So we want to make these measurements locally um, to see what's happening at, with, with icebergs and glaciers. Now, iceberg melt accounts for about 30 to 50 percent of the freshwater flux from Greenland. And these meltwater estimates are you know, what really we need as an input to drive our models. And, and so what we're really trying to do with the measurements we are making nowadays is to get much better senses, uh, a much better sense of what's happening in places like Greenland. Now, this is, uh, this is Greenland. And um, as you can see from this animation, uh, the Greenland, uh, Greenland ice mass sheet has been melting at a scary rate. You know, one of the things about uh, being a technologist um, working at, um, in, at, in Greenland and, and the Arctic is, you know, you build all these technologies and, uh, you know, you go out, you deploy them, and then they work. And you're, you know, kind of excited, oh, yes, that robot worked. That measurement is really good. But the flip side of that is those measurements are always very, very scary. There's very little good news, if any. Right? So this is um, an estimate of what's happening in the Greenland ice sheet. Now, Greenland is almost more important than any other place on the planet in terms of how um, you know, fresh water melt, melt is coming to our planet. Um, here's, um, here's another picture. This is actually um, us. This is a picture taken by Sarah Das. Uh, that's me in the red uh, and yellow suit. And we're trying to make measurements at the front of this carbon glacier. 
And, and the reason these icebergs and calming glaciers are important is, again, like I said, um, you know, we want to really understand what's happening. Now, you know, it's hard to give you a sense of scale, um, but that carving glacier, it, this is a small one, this is one we could tackle, is bigger than this entire block which comprises Fenway and five times as tall, right? And so the reason we're using these robots in this environment is that if a big chunk the size of this building falls off, if it falls on a robot, that's fine, it's okay, we just don't want anyone to get hurt. But we want to use all these technologies in areas which are extremely difficult to access and to make these measurements that are really important for all of us. Okay, here's just a little video uh, showing you what Greenland looks like. This is us on an expedition. Uh, we were on this uh, little ship called the uh, Rolf Jensen. These are icebergs, some footage of, um, you know, some drone footage that we took while we were there. And, you know, I always like to tell people, these are the most beautiful places on our planet, right? You know, they are national parks. They are vanishing, even in my lifetime as a researcher, which is only 20 years, they have changed so dramatically that, um, you know, it's, it's scary. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to you, Sarah, and um, I'll get, uh, and maybe you want to talk about what's happening locally. Thanks. So, as Hanu nicely set up, the poles are changing rapidly. The large polar ice sheets are melting at an accelerated rate. This is in direct response to the warming that our planet has been experiencing over recent decades and centuries. The Arctic is now warming four times faster than the global average. We used to say it was warming two times faster. Every time that we've looked at that number again, three times faster, now four times faster. Parts of the Arctic are in fact warming seven times faster than the global average. So it's a very sensitive area in response to this global warming. As Hanu showed with the map of Greenland, the melt around Greenland is accelerating. More and more ice is being lost every year in response to this warming. The same thing is now happening in the Antarctic. These are changes that have happened within my lifetime. So when I started working in the Antarctic, the ice sheet there was very stable. Similarly, the big changes in Greenland have happened just over the course of my career. What happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. What happens in the Antarctic doesn't stay in the Antarctic. It comes right back to us here at home. This picture behind me now is actually a shot that I took in my hometown of Citroen, Massachusetts, about 20 miles south of here, just this past December during a big winter storm. This is a street. Um, clearly underwater, cutting off an entire neighborhood, an entire community. We are experiencing flooding around the coast of Boston, Massachusetts, the United States, globally, in direct response to this melting ice, as well as other factors that are contributing to sea level rise. Boston is really at the epicenter of elevated sea level rise rates, and that is leading to increased amounts of flooding. We tend to talk often in science about projections of the future, what's coming, what are different scenarios. But really, if you take home nothing from else from today, it's that climate change is here now. These are impacts that are affecting us now. I could have gone out another half dozen time, times in my town and taken the same picture of flooding that we're experiencing. And almost everyone who lives around the coast in Massachusetts is having similar experiences. So, the ice is melting, we talk about sea level rise, but it's really flooding and inundation, which is where the rubber hits the, hits the road in terms of impacts. Um, this is a figure that uh, NASA's put together of historical flooding days in Boston over the last century. And this gives you a little bit of a time perspective. We tend to get used to what we are experiencing now, today. Um, we think, oh, of course Boston floods, you know, a few times a year. Um, up to now, almost 20 times a year, Boston experiences flooding. But this was not always the case, and this has increased dramatically over the last century. Um, if we were to take projections of future sea level rise um, into the next century, uh, these 20 days that we see now that are very disruptive um, would seem like a tiny bit uh, on the scale of the graph. With, by mid-century, we expect to experience 100 days a year of flooding in Boston. By the end of the century, close to every single day we'll experience these flood conditions. So this is a problem that we're facing here and now, but it's also only going to get exponentially worse going forwards. Um, this is a problem we need to understand, both as communities uh, and where do we allocate resources, but also, as many of you here today are interested 
in this um, climate tech? How does technology play a role in mitigating uh, future warming? So the future is not written in stone. We talk about future flooding. We're really talking about warming scenarios um, that are under what we call sort of business as usual, right? If we continue to emit the greenhouse gases at the rate we are now, which is continuing to accelerate, um, we will have more and more ice loss, more and more sea level rise. But it doesn't have to be that way. This is a critical decade to bring all this technology to bear and really start to bend that curve downwards and reduce the amount of future sea level rise and flood risk. Jen. So, so as I mentioned earlier, um, AI is now, um, we have powerful algorithms. How can we help? Uh, climate change is here. What can we do um, as an AI community and machine learning? How can we leverage those powerful methods to help us to help us um, face this grand challenge in, in society right now? So one of the things one can do would be um, how do you make better predict predictions of forecasting uh, extreme events, extreme weather events such as flooding, wildfires, droughts, and, and, and other settings? Um, another, another, um, another challenge to 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 models is how do we how do we make predictions at the local scale where I live? So a lot of Global climate models right now are, are, are at coarse resolution scale, so typically they are at 100 kilometer scale. But how do we how do I make better predictions or projections at, at the city of Boston or in Cape Cod um, or or wherever you live in your town? So so we need to have better models for 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 turning core scale resolution to high scale resolution. So uh, th this is an example of one of the things that our lab has been working on. And in addition to making better predictions, also to quantify the uncertainty of those estimates so that because a lot of these estimates are, are not perfect, so we, we, we also want to quantify and, and, and provide that to, to, to the designers. So having, having better predictions will now then allow um, would now allow decision makers and planners to, to make proper decisions on, on how to prepare for, for these disasters and extreme, extreme events. Um, so we have powerful algorithms, but we also know that AI methods could be, could be, could be difficult to understand, so we also need methods to allow us to make that more explainable and understandable to humans. So this is also another, another direction that our group has been working on to help us understand um, climate events and, and from, from these powerful models that, that, that are available. So I'll end here. Okay, and, great. Um, well, thank you, thank you both. And I, what I thought we'd do now for the remaining 15 minutes we have uh, for this panel is a couple of things. Um, we'd be happy to open it up to questions. If any of you have questions, please come up to the mic and, and speak. Um, in the meantime, to warm you all up, I'm going to ask questions. And I, I promised my panelists I would tell them what they were, but I, I didn't. So, uh, so I'm going to start with you, Sarah. And, and some of you may not know this, but Sarah is on the Mass um, Climate Science Advisory Panel for the Governor. So Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about what that is? I know it's a newly instituted um, advisory board, and, and what your thoughts are there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this year, the state launched um, a climate science advisory panel that reports to the state's Office of Climate Science. And I'm very privileged to sit on that panel, as well as um, uh, over a dozen other experts from around the state and region. And really, our role there is to help advise the state on providing the best science, the best resources, the best projections, so that the state can best prepare, allocate its resources, and protect um, the citizens and the environmental resources around the state in the face of climate change, both today and into the future. Um, my particular role on the panel um, uh, really uh, brings my background in um, earth science and glaciology to bear. So I can help uh, help the Office of Climate Science understand what is the latest science. It's, it's, it's evolving quickly. 
Um, but there are a lot of things that are certain and that we know. And so we also are trying to figure out what's the best way to provide information and data to citizens, to decision makers, to policy makers, to planners, um, in terms of risks that are, uh, are here and looming like sea level rise. Um, one of, the, one of the ways we can do that is, is using models and using observations. Of course, some of the things we are talking about on this panel to best make better predictions. Uh, another thing that we have that we can bring to bear, um, I feel like is sort of a superpower of being an Earth scientist, is, is we have a time machine. So we can look back into Earth's history and also see you know, what have sea levels looked like in the past when carbon dioxide atmospheric levels were what they are today. Um, and that's another important area to think about, you know, if we peer back uh, three million years when last time we had CO2 levels over 400 parts per million, sea level rise was actually 10 to 20 meters higher than it is today. So these are longer term projections, but it's also very important to put what's coming in the next decade and century in this longer term context. Uh, this is not a static or, or problem. Um, this is a, a moving <laughs> uh, window. And so I also bring that longer time scale perspective to the panel. Uh, and Jennifer, I have a question for you. I, know, I happen to know that you are uh, the director of the AI Institute at Northeastern. And you know what it, what's really nice about a conference like this is that we have people who are really interested in trying to solve problems. What are your thoughts on taking some of your AI technologies and partnering with various companies in terms of trying to come up with solutions? Um, thank you for your question. So, so again, AI has um, a lot of potential, and um, there are a lot of opportunities that we together, from, from various multidisciplines, can work together to help, to help solve um, this grand challenge of, of how do we how do we be more resilient to climate change? So for example, um, for example, to have better prediction at the local scale, we need, we need to put on more sensors so, so we can connect with experts on, on development of sensors and IoT devices so that, and then we can also work with AI to, to leverage all this information to help us better prediction at the local scale. So that's one example. Um, other example, and it can it doesn't have to be just just the the device people. We can also that it's also a good opportunity to work with communities in that case um, because we can work together to help us monitor um, precipitation or or air, air pollution where we are where we live um, through through this um, smart sensing technology. Um, other other opportunities would be. Um, Again, uh, risk prediction. So, so we, if we have better risk prediction models, then it can also inform inform um, companies on, uh, for insurance and also where do you where where do you invest and also to work with decision makers and planners what to what what to do as well to plan for these events. Um, other possibilities would be. Um, when there's a disaster, maybe work together with robotics, drone companies on, on search and rescue teams. Um, again, you can use AI for that as well. Um, there are so many examples. And also, we can use AI also to help design new materials, more sustainable materials, and, and, and um, opportunities like that as well. So um, there's there's many more. So OK, so I'm going to you know take off on something both of you said. You know, one thing, when we were discussing this panel, there were, you know, we could have talked about a lot of different issues. And we tried to focus on the connections between what's happening in the cryosphere and our local climate. But there's, you know, there are all these other effects as well. Uh, a classic one in New England is, of course, uh, the effect on fisheries. You know, and that's something I've been working on for a long period of time. And so if you look at the scallop fishery in New England, which is one of the most um, you know, important fisheries now, um, what's been happening is with you know, temperatures rising, the scallops have been migrating further north. The same thing's happening to lobsters. You know? And so it's, um, it's kind of scary to see all these effects roll into one. Now, when we look at fisheries, and you know, I was talking about AI, 
uh, one of the interesting issues is um, the way we do fisheries management, uh, you know, we've improved a lot. We do something called ecosystem-based management. We look at a lot of different fisheries and how they affect the whole entire ecosystem as a chain. But we do it using techniques that we've been doing for 100 or so years. We use trawl surveys. So we actually go out, NOAA goes out, the fisheries division catches fish, brings them on board, counts how many there are for you know, unit effort, sizes them, and then makes some predictions about the health of fisheries. So one other aspect is bringing new technologies to bear. So for the lobster industry, the big issue right now is uh, you know, uh, we are getting rope-less traps. You know, the ropes often get tangled with all sorts of things, so there's a big push to try and make them rope-less. For the scallop industry, the big issue is sort of catching, uh, catching and you know, throwing stuff away. We want to try and actually use uh, robots to you know, get, uh, get measurements that we can make. Now, the one lesson we've learned in all of this is that a community of involvement is really a big deal. You know, um, the fishermen, uh, you think of them as these rough you know, New Englanders going out to sea, but they are extremely smart and very, very quick to catch on when you're trying to help. My, my favorite story about this is we were trying to understand lobster traps, and we put GoPro cameras on the lobster traps. And, and we were noticing that the lobster was actually coming in and out of the traps, much more than the fishermen thought, right? And we had, in order to entice the fishermen to use them, we said, hey, we'll show you, we'll give you free cameras, just give us the imagery, and, uh, and then we can share the imagery with you. Very quickly, all the lobster fishermen started buying their own GoPros. Okay, because they realized it's a really interesting tool for them to understand what's happening to their traps. Okay, and so, you know, similarly with the scallop people, you know, when we talk about scallop and, and how we want to have areas that are closed off, that, you know, one of the interesting issues is the scallops don't know boundaries between the US and Canada. And one of the things they pointed out is if we close this area off, these scallops are going to grow, and then the currents are going to carry them over, over the water to the Canadian side, and the Canadian fishermen are going to benefit. And so, you know, this local knowledge is really key. You know, as academics, we can shout from the rooftops, and we've been very ineffective in terms of getting our message heard. And, and we've been ineffective for a couple of reasons, you know. If it was something like COVID, everybody listened, okay? Now, climate change is just as important, but it's 20 years down the line. And that's a hard message to get to people. So one, you know, if I had one other message to all of you, uh, because of course you're, uh, you know, you're part of the climate elite. If you're at this event, by definition, you're part of the climate elite. Is to please reach out to the community and try and show them in very real terms why what we can do is going to make a difference. Okay, and you know. I'd like you to follow up on that, Sarah. What do you think we can do to make people much more aware? I know we know the science, right? The science is incontrovertible, right? But convincing my neighbor down the street who, who uh, you know, has a Trump flag in his Republican, I'll say that loud, okay? Convincing that person to take it seriously. What do we do? Absolutely. Um, it's, it's an enormous challenge. The science is abundantly clear, and there is, is entire consensus about climate change, why it's happening, and um, what will happen if we don't essentially have a revolution in our energy economy. Um, one of the things I've learned over time, also as a climate communicator, is that it's really important to meet people where they are. And one thing that unites almost everyone is wanting to see a better future for themselves, for their family, for future generations. And what that means to people may look different, but almost everyone can agree that we want a safe, clean, habitable planet. Yeah, I'm gonna interrupt you there yeah. for one bit, right? Because one of the one of the really classic stories that I have is, you know, I, I would go to sea with these color fishermen. I would go on their boats, uh, you know, to help them with this technology. And you know, I'm, and I'm very good friends with them. And one of them said, you know, you know. You know, my father was a scholar fisherman. He's out of New Bedford, uh, on the Cathay Marie. He says, my father was a, fish, a scholar fisherman. I'm a scholar fisherman. I don't want my kids to be scholar fishermen. And I was like, okay, that's great. You know, they should have the freedom to choose. Like, no, 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 you don't understand. I would like them to be scholar fishermen, but seeing the future, I can't really genuinely ask them to be scholar fishermen because there's no future. And so. People like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. that, helps, that helps everyone get their mind around this future problem, you know, in the sort of political landscape. 
uh, we look out a couple of years. But if you think about your children or your grandchildren, now you're talking about generations down the road. I think about, you know, um, my children are teenagers. My daughter just graduated high school a couple of days ago. Um, she's going to be launching herself into the world. What sort of world do I want her to be living in when she's my age? What sort of world do I want my hopefully future grandchildren to be growing up in? Now we're talking you know, mid-century and beyond. And we have to really all imagine, take a step back and all imagine, what kind of world are we handing to future generations? There's an enormous responsibility that all of us in this room here have to make the changes that are necessary. And we need to make these changes now. Yesterday would have been the best time, but today, since we didn't do enough yesterday, today is the best time to start. And this decade, I really can't stress this enough, this decade is so vital to bending that curve of future emissions downward. All of the technology that we're deploying, we need to just imagine it at a scale which you probably can't even get your mind around. That is what is going to prevent the worst effects in terms of future warming future ice loss, sea level rise. But it doesn't stop at sea level rise, right? There's all these other factors. We have increased rainfall. We have heat waves. Um, most deaths related to climate across the United States and the world come from heat waves. And then you have compound factors, right? So if you imagine something like that flooded street that I showed a picture of, what if that coincides with a power outage or a heat, a heat wave and somebody needs to get to the hospital? Now you can't get a fire truck down that street, right? So everything compounds. You have increase in diseases, you have extreme droughts, and you have hurricanes, right? So everything is converging. Um, and we have so much power, we have so many tools and technology available, but we have to deploy them at scale and quickly. Jennifer, you want to add anything to that? No, I was going to say, maybe if we have questions from the audience. So yeah, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions, comments from the audience. I'm a professor, you know, if you don't ask me questions, I ask you questions. Okay, I happen to know a few people in this audience, and I will call them. Kim, what do you think? Kim Holloway. What people in the audience? There's a microphone right there. You want to come up with the microphone? Hi, Hanu. Thanks for that. Really appreciate it. Um, what, so there are plenty of people from industry, academia, and government in this room. What? are the tangible things that they need to be doing yesterday and today to try and make this happen? So, you know, I'll, I'll start and maybe you guys can join in. I think, you know, let's look at the entire carbon offset industry, right? Uh, you know, some of that is a little bit of smoke and mirrors, as we've been finding out over the last few years. But most of it is, you know, is genuine. The efforts are genuine, right? If we look at uh, you know protein protein for the third world, you know one of the other big problems is India, China. Uh, they are you know they claim rightfully that they are polluting less per person than you know the, than the Western world, but that still is not a, a, a good answer, right? They still want their people to get you know meat, fish, uh, high high doses of protein. How do we deal with that? So one example might be how do we do sustainable agriculture? Okay. Another might be, okay, how do we sequester more carbon? Now, the big problem with, and I, you know, I always have an issue with this, right? If you look at the best technologies that exist there, we need to pull those up by two orders of magnitude. Because even if the best technologies for carbon um, capture were to scale, we'd still make a very, very, very small uh, dent on the problem, right? And so really we need to somehow cut back on our, um, our carbon footprints individually as nations. And, uh, and then if we are going to talk about things like carbon sequestration and, uh, and carbon offsets, then we need to make uh, strides two, three, four orders of magnitude, not you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.10%. Terry, you want to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll just... Um, the final the, words in the last 10 seconds words. that we have. Yeah, absolutely. So the number one thing that people can do today is to talk to their neighbor, the person to your right, to your left, talk to your friends, talk to your elected officials. Make them understand that this is important to you, that you value a safe and habitable future for yourself and for everyone in the, in the future, and that that is going to require transformative change. So everyone in this room has a role to play in whatever industry you're in to make climate change their top priority. You had a question. I know we're out of time, but you're ready for a question. Go for it. I'm an 
I'm another unintentional plant from Northeastern University, <laughs> plant in the audience, Sheila Puffer, uh, DeMore McKim School of Business. I'm hosting a conference at Northeastern on June 20th called Saving Sand to Save the Planet. And I, uh, particularly the construction industry is what I'm focusing on to have new materials that use less sand. How has uh, sand figured into your research, particularly Dr. Das, since you are an earth scientist as well? Are you? Um, um, concrete. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have to think about all sectors of the energy economy um, when you think about climate. So construction is a big one. Um, you know, sand plays many roles. I think of sand as important in in industry, but also, uh, you know, as a, for example, important in a place like Greenland, where you know much sediment is created by uh, melting of glaciers. I really think the most important thing is for everyone to just think about what industry they're in, how they can um, use that to um, to change the needle at a scale which really needs to move faster and faster. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, we appreciate um, the invitation, and hopefully you enjoyed this panel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.